For trichomes.com, I'm Jesse Batend, and this is The High Ground. On this show, we talk to leaders of the cannabis industry, everyone from farmers to CEOs and public officials, anyone making an impact on the cannabis community and beyond. Being a leader in cannabis means existing at the whims of regulation. That's especially true for companies that make a cannabis derivative. For instance, edibles needing to meet food safety standards. There are vulnerabilities on both sides. My guest today knows a bit about that. JT Thompson is the owner and general manager of Sublime Solutions in Oregon. They specialize in cannabis extractions, and they're the good stuff in a number of leading vape products. Last October, after two deaths possibly linked to vaping in the state of Oregon, Oregon's governor issued a six-month ban on all flavored vape products, including botanical extractions, which clearly was going to be a problem for JT. We'll talk about surviving that, JT's wild personal story, and how he's navigating the current coronavirus pandemic. JT, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, Jesse. So let's just start out here with uh, the, the current moment. Where, where are you right now? What's your quarantine situation like? Um, well, you know, Eugene's kind of a, a smaller city, which is nice. Um, but there are the restrictions that are most everywhere. Um, personally, fortunately, uh, with our industry being considered a basically uh, essential industry, uh, we definitely have been able to keep operating. Thank goodness. Um, Personally, I'm fortunate enough to drive 12 to 15 minutes on a semi-rural road, go out to the property I live on and hang out there with my lovely partner. And if I go into town on a regular basis once a week, that's, you know, three or four times a month, that's probably pretty normal. So for me, it personally, it hasn't had much effect. Now, some of my workers who live in town and so forth, you know, we've done what we need to do, talked with the health department uh, and our inspectors there, and of course, looked at all the, uh, you know, came up with a basic policy. I've got most of my production team is basically working from home most of the time right now. Fortunately, we were at the three-year period that we have for a full review of our GMP infrastructure. Uh, so they're at home with plenty of work, you know, yeah. updating SOPs and revising batch records where they need to and doing all those things. Um, and then I have a number of people, of course, that are here. We're still working on R&D projects. We still are doing some level of production, but mostly it's a back end packaging and so forth because we had built up a lot of feedstock for most of our clients previous to the coronavirus hitting, um, we contract manufacture at this point for a number of brands in the state. Uh, we don't have a brand out ourselves yet, although we're planning to later this year uh, so that we can survive a little bit better. Hmm. Uh, and we can talk about why the Oregon market being one of the toughest in the country, there's very little room right now for a full contractor model, as is uh, the case in many industries that you kind of get layers of specialists that add up to the products that the consumer sees. Um, so we fared uh, pretty well. Uh, and with a bit of a rush on the dispensaries a few weeks ago, it's caused a number of our clients to, you know, reorder at a little bit higher of a rate. Uh, but you know, for us, it's been really tough in the sense that with last fall's vape crisis, which you mentioned in the introduction, that hit us extremely hard. I lost 70% of my revenue and a little over 50% of my employees overnight. Hmm. And that was happening just as we were going into the yearly industry slump. That's just natural from late November through probably mid February is the worst time at least where we're at in the supply chain for business to you know happen and the reason being at least one of the main reasons and you can imagine i'm a retailer i've got a bunch of inventory i've stocked up to get through the holiday season i'm not interested in ordering new inventory because i want as little inventory at year end for my tax purposes as possible and so for those of us on the supply side, it's definitely the sort of, uh, you know, thin part of the year. So we had both of those things, you know, basically happening concurrently. 
it's taken us a bit longer to come back out of that. Uh, my company is independently owned and operated. Uh, we don't have any investors. We don't have any major debts, um, but we're self-funded and kind of a, a bootstrap sort of operation. So to get through this, you know, we literally got to paycheck to paycheck uh, and then mm. had to work with our clients to bring certain accounts back into uh, proper balance and set some kind of new boundaries. And, you know, the last, I would say, six to eight weeks for us, things have really started picking up, um, you know, and all the work we did last year in developing an in-house brand, we had to put on hold. So we had locked up a bunch of capital into that. And then, you know, we haven't been able to launch anything. So we really took a hard, hard hit, but given the basic values that we hold and the way my team works and the position we have in the industry here, we were able to eke through and now we're, you know, coming back to what we would consider more than less, you know, normal revenues and cash flow and so forth. So, you know, we've just recently sighed a big sigh of relief. Uh, hmm. And now we can actualize the plans that we had last year, this year, and hopefully get to the next level of success. I, I was shocked in our first year because we had no presence in the medical market, which was very uh, mature at that point here. And within the first year, you know, we were manufacturing four or five of the top 10 brands that do vape products in the state and 10 of the top 20. Um, so without me really focusing on that and realizing it at one point, my sales director said, well, you know, we're actually one of, if not the biggest providers in the state. And we commanded in those first couple of years, anywhere from, you know, 25 or 35 percent of all the vape oil on the market in Oregon was being manufactured here. And so you had Select, which was the big one out of the gate. And then, you know, a couple of years in a, a group called Buddies stepped up and they're selling, you know, huge amounts beyond other people. But when you stopped and looked at all the individual brands and added up all of them that we manufacture, we were actually putting out more oil than any of the biggest brands. So let's go back to October of 2019 and, and maybe pre-October of 2019, um, when the first news stories of what was going on with the vape crisis started to kind of occur, what were you looking at? Did you expect it to impact you as much as you did? No, no. Given the level of mm, scientific savvy that we have and had here at the time, um, we had the the group that helped us set this shop up is called the Workshop out of Southern California. And we actually hosted their research group here for the first two and a half, three years. So high level PhD sort of chemists, been in pharmaceutics. Of course, I'd been in the big nutraceutical and herbal industry. So we had a powerhouse of, of foresight and understanding around, you know, industries that deal with psychoactives and so forth and, and uh, supplements and things like that. So we knew pretty quickly as uh, the news was breaking that uh, our products were clean, number one, and that if we could influence and educate the regulators properly, uh, we would have avoided a knee-jerk reaction. Now, that wasn't the case, although we were able to blunt the effect to some extent. And the timing of the ban was delayed a bit by some of the efforts, you know, that we had with the governor's office and through a lobbying group that I'm on the board of. In fact, I think it was about two or three weeks before the, they did the ban, the governor's office called me to discuss you know, some of the issues. And hmm. I think they would have not quite gone as far as they did if there hadn't been Oregon Health Authority and the teenage, you know, Nick vaping problem. Um, right. That they wanted to slow down. And I fully agree with that. That's, I mean, but they conflated the two issues. 
And then, you know, with the media cycle being what it was, it was like, well, we have to do something. OHA is, is, is putting huge pressure to clamp down and put a ban in place uh, like some of the other states, whereas we were lobbying. You don't have to go that far. Here are some of the things that you can start doing immediately that will ameliorate the fears of the consumers and actually put OLCC, the Cannabis Regular here, Oregon Liquor Control Commission, and the state in a better position in in terms of optics uh, compared to the other state systems will, you know, add another feather to the cap because Oregon's got a few feathers in the cap for having the best pesticide laws, you know, and pioneering how those should be done right. Uh, our labeling laws are more sophisticated than most of the other uh, state markets and so forth. And we've held consults directly on a lot of those things. Um, in fact, we even host, uh, I just had a bunch of state fire marshals and building permit people uh, come in for an educational day with our scientists and to see the factory um, and stuff like that. You know, we had heavily lobbied behind the scenes with the executive director, with, you know, um, of OLCC with some of the legislative friends that we have. We have a state senator who's our local state senator is the top cannabis politician in the state. So we're allied very closely with them, you know, help, you know, build language for, you know, some of the legislation that gets passed through. Of course, we work with OLCC on the rules language. So we're in a, a very interesting and in some senses, somewhat unique position here in Oregon to have that kind of purview and influence. Like I said, the governor's office called me three weeks before they put the ban in place for some advisement. Now, like I said, we didn't get everything we wanted. The fact that Oregon was the only, as far as I know, the only state that when they put the ban in, and it was about the flavors, right? So anything that was non-cannabis derived was not going to be acceptable but because of our lobbying, they put in a clause that said, we're going to put a review board in place so that if you can give us a certain security of documentation and evidence, then we may give a waiver for your particular, you know, non-cannabis derived terpene flavors. Um, so they had actually allowed us a potential avenue if the ban had stayed in effect or gone permanent to actually go through an approval process and get our products back out on the market. I mean, we put out in the first two and a half years up to that point, I got to believe we put out, you know, at least five plus million individual units into the Oregon marketplace. Never once did we have any indication or report of an adverse event. And so kind of proof is in the pudding. And yet with, like I said, the Oregon Health Authority, you know, causing such a stink, the governor just did a, a, a complete ban on flavors on both sides of the coin. And, you know, of course, the tobacco lobby and industry was ready for that. They'd been ready because other states had started moving down that line. And within, I think it was less than a week an outside tobacco group with, you know, state uh, tobacco groups for them got the ban overturned. And it took them, I think, five days. For us on the cannabis side, uh, it took a month. And fortunately, right after they did the announcement and they did the, uh, you know, public press, uh, what do you call it, uh, you know, press briefing, which I was at, um, you know, I was taken out to lunch by one of the law firms in the state that does a lot of cannabis work and was asked if we would be the plaintiff on a suit to stay the ban for cannabis. And of course, I said, no, <laughs> um, <laughs> I can't do that. I'm willing to. And they had some other, you know, licensees that they had sort of begun to talk to about helping to fund the suit and, you know, get a number of people you know, some of the quality businesses and licensees behind this push. And I said, I'm more than willing to help facilitate it, but I have too many connections at the regulatory level, both in the legislature and with, you know, OLCC and OHA, 
that I can't risk damaging those relationships and losing those channels through which we can, you know, have some leverage. So fortunately, one of the biggest clients that we manufacture for that's now a multi-state brand, Winbury Farms, um, you know, their parent company, they'd been bought out, uh, you know, after talking to me was like, hey, we'll do it. We'll be the plaintiff. We'll, hmm. we'll stick our necks out and go ahead and take it on. And so we got it together uh, and it took four weeks from the time the ban was, you know, put in place before Oregon's court uh, decided, no, nope, we're going to put an injunction in. Of course, OLCC and the DOJ here, you know, tried once more to get the courts to do a second review, uh, which the courts did. And, you know, the top circuit court judge here in Oregon who had not looked at it in the first round, it gets kicked up to him or her uh, with some advisement from a couple of the other circuit court judges. And they looked at it and they said, no, the plaintiff has a very good case, uh, you know, basically implied that probably the plaintiff's going to win. Uh, and then OLCC dropped it and they removed the ban. But by that time, the damage had already been done. At the consumer level, the perception was already, you know, damaged. Um, and although the sale of all of the vape products has begun to come up, the what people are calling the botanically derived terpene lines are, are definitely bouncing back. The consumer has basically, you know, said, we enjoy and appreciate these types of products and we want them. And if they're done properly, they can be extremely safe. And come to find out most of the problem, which we were telling them, you know, from early on as this was all being worked out, you're going to find out most of it is coming from the black market. And we can already see that based on looking at the epidemiology of those first few months and some of the reports that were coming out. I mean, I told the executive director of OLCC at the press conference, you know, you realize that we're going to find out it's not the flavors. And <laughs> here's what you're going to find out. It's stuff like vitamin E acetate in combination with high levels of pesticides and potentially, you know, cheap hardware uh, coming out of China. At the same time that vitamin E acetate was being brought on the market, uh, generally by some pretty shady people, uh, you had California coming online with adult use and with Prop 65, which has clauses about uh, heavy metals and heavy metal toxicity in all kinds of products, lead being the big one, uh, it's very strict. And a lot of the standard hardware that used lead, silver, solder, which is very common, were not able to pass muster in California. So the big Chinese companies, what are they going to do? Well, the high quality ones said, okay, we're going to need to retool that. And they went to other amalgams that did not include as toxic of materials. On the other hand, the cheap ones, likely the ones most bought by the black market, they went to silver cadmium solder and metal fumes, particularly things like cadmium. When cadmium vaporizes, it can cause extremely acute problems hmm. in the lungs. So now you've got three potential factors out there in the marketplace that somehow came all together at the same time. And I told him, I said, you, you know, when you put one of these things out that has a problem, say it's pesticides. Yeah, say there's mycobutanol, which when it vaporizes turns into hydrogen cyanide. Very dangerous. Well, tiny little bits of that, a lot of people's systems can handle that. They can metabolize it, get rid of it. It never becomes overly toxic. Well, but now think of adding a second insult with these heavy lipids like vitamin E acetate that your lungs cannot metabolize out of the, your system. So I'm clogging up my lungs. I can create lipid pneumonia with that. And now I've also got these high levels of pesticides. Well, one plus one doesn't necessarily equal two when you have disease or toxic factors in vectors coming together. Now you add the potential of cadmium fumes on top of those two, 
and you've got a cocktail that if somebody is not doesn't have a really strong immune system, doesn't have any pulmonary existing problems or something, boy, you can lay somebody down really quick. And of course, it turns out a lot of these people also smoke tobacco in one form or another. And the combination of cannabis and tobacco smoking is worse than either one alone by far. I've seen studies in my (laughs) days gone by on that and they've been replicated. So it's like cannabis smoking is actually, sure, it's dangerous because you got particulates and stuff. But compared to nicotine and cigarette smoking, it doesn't even compare. It's much closer to baseline. You actually put the two together in close proximity and it's far and away worse than just plain nicotine. Right. So people that do both should be very cautious as to how they mix those things when they do the timings of them and so forth. Anyway, the point being is you get all these potential toxic vectors coming together and it makes for a lot of confusion. So it's like, wait, yep, it looks like vitamin E at first, but wait, but that's not in every case. And it looks like mostly it's on the cannabis side, but there's some people that are claiming they're just doing the nicotine vape and they're having the same problems. So understand the confusion there and doing epidemiology and pulling these things apart is, it's an art and a science. It really is. So it took them a while. Was the OLCC receptive to that argument? Oh, I think as a lot of the individuals there were sympathetic Um, I think this is one of the reasons why, like I said, at least when they put the ban language together, that they uh, opened up an avenue that was going to be vetted by a number of experts in terms of being able to get approval for certain uh, ingredients and additives. We've been suggesting that when they changed the labeling rules about a year or so before that, and had strongly pushed, and they almost did it if they'd have had the resources and weren't as scatterbrained as they are. And don't get me wrong. I, I've got friends and, and try and build good uh, working relationships with the regulators. I suggest every cannabis company, don't be afraid of your regulator. You know, go and work with them. Their job is to make a good program and to continue to improve it. And yes, one of their main jobs is consumer awareness and safety, but it's also to make for a successful business, you know? And so riding that line is important, but a lot of my friends here and acquaintances, particularly those that came up through the black market, it was like, oh my God, that's big brother. I don't want to talk to him. <laughs> I don't want him in my shop. And I was like, you, 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 you're actually going to be in an impoverished situation. And when you need help, and you want to influence things, you're not going to have the avenues that you would otherwise. And so, like I said, we've gotten great good benefit in working directly with them using that approach. So back to your question, a number of them individually were like, what you're saying makes sense. As an organization that was involved with other, you know, uh, parts of the government, OHA, the governor's office, uh, Oregon Department of Agriculture, you know, they're all involved in this stuff. And so then you have to, there's this layer of political pressure and then the media cycle comes in and that gets, you know, exaggerated and twisted in certain ways. And I I don't envy the politicians. I I know people gripe about politicians and stuff, but my God, what I've learned uh, being in this industry and working this closely with the regulators and with the legislature and the people there, they've got one of the toughest jobs I I can even imagine. Hmm. I'm a legislator and I'm supposed to be able to vote for my constituency based on objective, rational information across transportation, health, education, business, environment. You're asking somebody to actually be able to understand and make a reasonable decision on these things. How do these people do it? Well, as Senator Przanski said to us one time when he was here, he said, that's why I'm here with you, because we we had some people that wanted to gut the pesticide rules about two years ago. And it was bad operators who just wanted to be able to, you know, get away with using bad practices and lots of pesticides. 
And so, you know, Floyd came in with a few people. We got one of the top lab directors, compliance lab directors, who is a friend of ours, our own PhDs, and sat down with them. And we said, well, this is the best of our understanding here and why we would suggest this is stupid. And here's a bunch of the technical rationale around it. Here's a bunch of, you know, information from other industries that we've been in, you know, collectively that have had to deal with some of this stuff. And he looked at us and he said, this is great. And he said, this is, I don't care if it seems a little bit hairball, whatever, if you get more information, talk to me in many cases, we in the legislature have to find respectable, trustworthy people that obviously know a hell of a lot more than we do so that we can get proper advisement. So this is, this is good and positive lobbying, if you will. And of course, in this case, he came to us. And then you get, again, there's always the downside, the other side of the coin where, you know, a lot of paid lobbyists, it's true. They get a bad rap because all they're doing is being self-interested and greedy. But that doesn't mean all lobbying is bad or all lobbyists aren't really there with some ethics. So, yeah, so they, they, they did listen, like I said, to a bunch of what we had. But as an organization, eventually, and, and as, you know, the governor who had to do something, she kind of caved, given the best of what she was getting and the political pressure that she was under. And, of course you know, the nicotine industry. And then we in our industry, you know, had to raise our hand and said, Hey, Hey, that's ill-informed and you're damaging, you're doing more damage by putting this ban in place than you need to, because you don't need to do this. And you're going to find out that the legal regulated market is not where the problem's coming from. Even in the sense that here in Oregon, the two deaths and even most of the 11, I think, or 12 people that ended up getting classified with the problem, many of them said they got their stuff from a legal store. And when asked by some of the regulator people, they said, see, this is the problem here in Oregon, is that the, it, there is some correlation to this. And I said to, a couple of things. Number one, some of these people in distress in the hospital might not really be willing to tell you that they got it from a black market source, right? <laughs> Number two, there is very good possibility that some processors were sold this ingredient when nobody knew that it was problematic. They don't have the business savvy or experience to actually vet the ingredient. They're just taking it on faith from the provider. And we know that here in Oregon, there was a guy called Mr. Extractor that was selling this product into the cannabis industry. It's on record, he came to OLCC, asked them how it would be labeled, because like I said, we now have more sophisticated labeling process and what you have to disclose, went back and forth with OLCC, you know, never got really satisfied. And he, when it all went public, he started saying things in public like, oh, I've got scientific studies that prove that a little bit of something like vitamin E acetate in the lungs is actually a good thing. You know, hmm. I, I can guarantee you that 90% of the products in all of the cannabis markets have similar agents in them because they're so effective as diluents, cutting agents, whatever you want to talk about. And of course, when it really hit the fan, he said, oh, but by the way, I never sold any of it to any licensees in Oregon. That's like, dude, your basis of operation is in Portland based on anecdotal evidence that I have from people that have had kind of come up against this guy before, very shady operator. So I said to OLCC, when it all happened, I said, right there, he could have sold that to a couple of licensees who didn't know any better. They used it in their product. It got on the shelf. The state regulatory agency hadn't put the, in, the ingredients panel that we talked about a year and a half or two ago together. They almost did. And then it's like, oh, we don't quite have time and resource for it. Well, now a year or so later, we get the vape ban. And I said, I hate to tell you, say I told you so. But if you had had this vetting thing in place, you probably could have avoided any of it getting, you know, uh, innocently into any product here. 
because I keep telling them, look, FDA is going to go this way. You're going to have to vet ingredients once it goes national. Why don't we do it now here in Oregon and you're going to have our industry's businesses ahead of the game? Why don't you really institute proper best business practices? For me, it's called GMPs, good manufacturing practices, which you have a little bit of in the rule set, but you could get rid of all your seed to sale stuff and do what the federal government does for things like pharmaceutics and a bunch of other industries, the herbal industry and so forth. You meet minimum GMPs, you can operate, and we know it's auditable. So if we ever find out there's a problem with your business, we can come in and audit it. We don't need a seed to sale system. No, no, pharmaceutics doesn't have anything like we have. And those are far more dangerous than what we're doing. So anyway, point being, we keep lobbying the state, look forward, I was told by the politicians when we first started our project four or five years ago and we were put in touch with them, oh, we want Oregon's to be the poster child. We want it to be the best rule set. We want it to be the, the best market. And I took them seriously and I said, okay, well, here's some things I know that can help. And right now the seed to sale systems, they actually get in the way of being able to apply certain best business practices. It's crazy. You know? Hmm. So anyway, uh, back to the vape man thing. So yeah, we were pushing this stuff and saying, hey, you know, we're here. Uh, and, and like I said, we got some traction, but there's so many people pulling so many different directions on them. And many of the people that actually build a relationship of one, at one level or another, unfortunately, are very, very self-centered and looking for their own individual business uh, advantage. My take is I'd rather approach it from a more what I call uh, enlightened self-interest because if it's just best business practices going to bring the industry up to the best, most competitive, fair standards, it's not just in my best interest. It's in everybody's best interest. So it's a kind of enlightened self-interest. Yeah, it's in my best interest to have these things change the way I think they should be and a lot of others. And I've seen, as I told you uh, before we started recording, I've worked across seven major industries of various different types. And it's like, if you have good regulation, it really helps business. And it, it weeds out the people that don't want to play fair and don't want to operate safely and with, you know, decent business practices. Over-regulation, you're throwing it away to the big corporations, basically. There's a middle ground there that it's like, let's look at the precedences in some of these similar industries. Let's not go too overboard. And we just keep working with people that are willing to listen, understand the concepts, you know, are at least going to be open minded to entertain proper changes. And we have, we've gotten a number of good things in or been able to you know, massage a number of things so that they weren't out of hand. That's what you get if you're willing to work in a mature fashion with the regulators. You know, instead of, oh, they're always out to get us and they just want to, you know, meet out fines and screw with people and stuff like that. You know, you got to lean on, I want to work with the regulators. I want to really understand the issues. I mean, some of the labs don't even really understand their rule sets fully. We have to, and I have a lab right here in my shop as a contract manufacturer. My model was, I'm going to have a lab for QC, product development, all these other things. I, I can, my production's under really great control. We, we, I think we still pretty much sample seven control points along our primary process. All get sampled, every batch, get run. We know exactly what the efficiencies are. If a machine breaks down or there's some little tweak, we're going to catch it real quick, know exactly what the problem is, troubleshoot it, fix it, and move on. So it's like, I've got a lab, I've got chemists here, makes it great working with the compliance labs because a lot of times we point out where they made it a mistake. But I know a lot of other companies don't have some of these luxuries in the sense of the way their business is set up. Some of them don't really even care. They just want to put out product and make money. And I get it. That's fine. You know, personally, I, I still am not working primarily for money. Never have in my life and probably never will. 
Um, you know, not that money is not important. Don't get me wrong. I was a single parent, like a single custodial parent personally. So I, I, I know you have to have money. That's the way culture works. But it's never been my primary motivation. Um, you know, with this company, it's a little bit higher because I've worked only for my passion. I don't have anything in savings, no big retirement or 401k or anything like that. So with this one, I, I definitely need to make some retirement money. But even still, it's I really enjoy cannabis and things like it. I really love working with people, particularly young people, and mentoring and chemistry and biology and process engineering. These are all just super intriguing things. I, mean, I got paid to learn how to run a big GC project to build this factory. We didn't have an architect. We saved a lot of money. I had a few connections in town that said, oh, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll walk you through. Dude, I, I got a huge education that you can't go to school and, and pay f to get it. I got it and I got paid. Legal regulatory, never had to deal with any of that stuff in the industries I've been in, uh, little bits, but not directly. You know, I've been an operational and or a big project manager very quickly at most places I've been. Somebody else deals with the finances, somebody else deals with the legal, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, but this time I get to get all of it. That's as valuable to me as just having a fat paycheck, you know. Um, so anyway, yeah, um, <laughs> it's been quite a ride. And that regulatory piece, you know, like I said, I know some people are still kind of sore that we had to go through the ban process and everything. And, oh, see, this, that's just indication that those people don't understand and won't listen and stuff. And I said, actually, they, you can see evidence that they did listen to us a bit. They allowed for an avenue that you could get through and get back to making these products that they, had, they felt they had to ban for a short period to make sure that safety was addressed. I told them, I said, vitamin E acetate, any longer chain fat, you don't want to ingest into your lungs. I knew that well back in 2009, 2010, when I was first in touch with the scientists at the workshop and we started discussing this project, they'd already tuned into it. They're like, okay, that's why we've got a, we've got a diluent that's a naturally based terpene that's found in cannabis and 99% of all other green plants. And because with MCT, PG, VG, all these other things that people are using at the time in the medical markets, we know that those all have some potential downsides. And we figured out that this natural terpene actually could be used the same way for the same purpose. And you alleviate any of those problems. And actually, it makes the oil taste a bit smoother. It has a smoother effect like organoleptically on your throat in your mouth, the mouth feels much better. That's why when I opened this company, we had had no presence in the medical market. We had no clients. And within eight months to 10 months, we're manufacturing 10 of the top 20 brands in the state and had won the dope cup. One of the main reasons, the engineering of the flavors that we were using from this group, the workshop, and that diluent. Hmm. JT Thompson is the owner and general manager of Sublime Solutions in Oregon. JT, thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, Jesse. You can find more cannabis industry reporting at trichomes.com, as well as more great shows like this one. If you're a member of the cannabis community and you have a story you want to share with us, reach out. You can reach the show at highground at trichomes.com. Please take a second to subscribe to the podcast and write a review. It really helps others find the show. You can also join the discussion with industry insiders and get your voice heard by joining the community at trichomes.com and following us on all social media. The High Ground is produced by David Fortin. I'm Jesse Patend, and thank you for listening.